Well, welcome to our evening service at Mira Mesa Bible Baptist Church. Welcome back. Trust you had a great day today. We did. Uh, we had a nice sunny afternoon, and I spent a little bit of time sitting out in the sun reading my Bible today to talk about what I was reading here in a minute and what I was meditating on today. But we welcome you back. We thank God for uh, the ability for us to get together this morning this way uh, via this uh, videotape. And, of course, it's being streamed uh, for folks to watch it. And we thank God for the ability for us to do this. But uh, welcome back. Praise the Lord. Uh, it's good to be saved, isn't it? I'm glad I'm saved. I praise the Lord that God saved me uh, all these many years ago and that I know that I have a home in heaven. i washing the blood of the Lamb. My sins have been forgiven. Amen. And uh, I know that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And I trust that's true for you tonight. And if not, I pray that if you have never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, uh, that you'd bow your head in true repentance, trusting in Him, in the finished work of Calvary, the finished work of the cross, the precious blood of the Lamb, confessing your sins and and turning away from your sin and turning to Christ and crying out to him, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, believing the gospel that Christ died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood for you and praise the Lord. He rose again bodily from the dead on the third day. God incarnate, uh, God in the flesh, dying for your sins and for mine on Calvary's tree, that old rugged cross. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be back together again tonight. Uh, as has been my, my, uh, uh, my habit here over recent weeks, I've been doing an awful lot of study in the area of hymnody. I love to do a study in hymnody. I like to look at the background of the old hymns of the faith that we sing out of our, uh, out of our hymnals. And uh, I, I've been uh, doing a little bit of study here recently in a couple of hymns I hadn't thought about recently. I didn't know a whole lot about their history and what was uh, surrounding their history of these hymns. But the one tonight I want to look at is what a friend we have in Jesus. And by the way, tonight I'm going to speak about friendship. I don't know about you, but uh, I thank God for uh, for friendship. I thank the Lord for uh, those faithful friends that I've had over the years and for the ability, the privilege of being, being a friend. Uh, you know, the world's not a friend to us, and I'll tell you what, we were saved. We ought to be a friend to one another. We need one another, and loyalty is a big thing. We need to understand how important it is for us to demonstrate loyalty to those that are, that are our friends. And we know we talk about loyalty within the military and uh, we hear about loyalty in, in the uh, various uh, police agencies and how they're tight-knit units and tight-knit organizations. I was a part of one of those organizations for many years, as, as have some of you been. And I developed some pretty close relationships in the military because we really are, uh, we, our lives depend upon one another. We watch out for each other. And I've had uh, a couple of guys save my life, believe it or not, working on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. A couple of different times uh, I had people save me, two men saved me for going up intakes. Uh, on the flight deck, and I could have been killed, and I'm thankful for that, and I didn't know those men, but I consider them to be my friends in the fight, and so we were looking out for each other, we took care of one another, and even though we didn't know each other, we're still demonstrating a loyalty to one another as military people, we, we have each other's back, so friendship's an important thing, and I appreciate my friends, and I, again, as I said, I appreciate the privilege of being a friend, and I'm glad that since this whole thing has started with this, uh, this lockdown, this stay-at-home order, uh, I've been able to, to uh, communicate with friends around the country, pastor friends that I count as precious and uh, they're, they're important to me. And I have been glad that we've been able to text and email and uh, make phone calls and the rest of that to encourage one another. I, I have a young man that I have been, uh, have been communicating with in Virginia, another uh, dear young man up in Fresno, another one up in Lodi, uh, another one in Modesto, a, a preacher in Stockton that I know real well, uh, and uh, one up in Oregon. So We've been able to communicate, and that's been a good thing, and I'm thankful for that. And these are my friends, and I'm glad that I have that connection, those friends that are so precious to me. And, uh, and, uh, I, and I know you have friends, too, that are precious to you, and so uh, we really need to be a friend to one another. But what a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, certainly, he's the ultimate friend. And I, I just want to read you the, the uh, background behind this hymn. I love to do the background studies, and this is a short history, a short biography. A man by the name of Joseph Scriven, who was born in 1819 and died in 1886. And here's just a very short sketch of his life. It says, Joseph Scriven was a man acquainted with grief. Born in County Down, Ireland, he aspired as a young man to follow in his father's footsteps as a Royal Marine. But his poor health made that impossible. Then he fell in love and was engaged to be married, but his fiance drowned before their wedding could take place. To put as much distance as possible between himself and that tragedy, <clears throat> Scriven then moved to Canada. But while living there, he became engaged again. But his fiance became ill and died before they could be married. So in his grief, Scriven determined to devote himself to a life of service. He was especially known for carrying a buck saw and cutting firewood for people in need. Uh, he lived a philanthropic life. He was uh, a help to many, many different people, both financially 
in, in other ways. Scriven received word that his mother was ill, and he couldn't afford to return to Ireland, so he sent his mother a poem in the hope that it would comfort her. The poem began this way. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. He later submitted a copy of his poem to a religious journal where it was published. A few years later, in 1886, he died. But his poem lived on in ways that he could never have imagined. Ira Sankey, the musician who worked with Dwight L. Moody, a song leader, uh, published it in a book of hymns, and Moody had it sung in his evangelistic meetings. In fact, D.L. Moody said that it was probably one of the most precious hymns uh, that he ever heard. Soon, What a Friend We Have in Jesus was one of the best-known hymns in America, even though it was written in Canada. Missionaries took it abroad, where people sang it in many different languages, uh, and still, stu still do so to this day. This hymn has maintained its popularity for a century and a half, probably because of a man acquainted with grief. Uh, a man who happened also to be acquainted with faith uh, helps us to see that faith can triumph over grief. I thought that was good about Joseph Scriven and the background behind What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And I'll just read you the lyrics, just three stanzas. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our griefs, uh, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Well, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Uh, precious uh, lyrics, are they not? And it encourages my heart. When we sing it, uh, I tell you what, I, I've been in churches where that thing's been sung. I've watched people actually weep when they sing this thing, especially the last stanza, because uh, they've had many people that they considered to be their friends that ended up hating them and turning on them. We know the world does that. There's a lot of backstabbing in the world. We know that in the business world is dog eat dog. We know that everybody's for themselves many times. It's not that way everywhere. I don't want to paint it with too broad a brush, but many times in the world, the unsaved, that's the way they behave themselves. It's not about you. It's about them. But we in the household of faith ought not live like that. Uh, we ought to be a true friend. We ought to be a faithful friend. We ought to be a loyal friend. I'll share with you some things about friendship in a little bit, but we're going we're gonna to look at friendship tonight, and, uh, and uh, we ought to be thankful for our friends. I'm glad for my friends I said a little bit earlier. By the way, I've said this for many years. My, my best friend's my wife. I thank God for my wife. She is my best friend. I'd rather spend time with her than anybody. I can remember I come back from uh, a, uh, almost a one-year deployment to Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War, and uh, uh, one of the officers in my squadron had a boat, and, um, and uh, at the chief that I work with, uh, this chief and I loved to fish, and so did uh, Mr. Kramer, Lieutenant Commander Kramer. So uh, Commander Kramer would invite us to go fishing with him on his, uh, on his boat, and we'd go off the coast of San Diego and fish. And... Um, I, and, and I enjoy doing that. But one, I remember one time when we first came back off the deployment, uh, Commander Kramer said to me, hey, listen, Mershon, you want to go fishing this weekend? I said, you know what? We just got back off deployment, sir. Uh, I'd rather, listen, I, I've been hanging around with guys for 11 months. I've been around men for 11 months, and I, and I appreciate you guys, and you, you're all my friends, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather go home and spend time with Mama. Uh, I've been away from her for all this time. I need to spend time with my wife and my daughter. Uh, but thank you for the invitation. And, uh, but yet at the same time, my wife has been my best friend these 50, almost 50, 55 years. And I'm really thankful for her. Uh, but I have many other friends in the ministry, especially. Uh, but I want to read this to you out of second Kings chapter two. So if you have your Bible tonight, if you'd open the second Kings two, not my text, but I just want to point something out here about the relationship between Elijah and Elisha. One of the great friendships in the Bible and loyalty is, is de demonstrated here by Elisha towards Elijah. And we know that Elijah is about ready to be caught up in a whirlwind into glory. And, he, and the mantle from Elijah is to pass to Elisha. And I think this is a great study in loyalty between friends. Not just friends, but servants of God. Wouldn't well, there be some loyalty amongst the servants of God, don't you think? And by the way, we're all servants of the Lord. There ought to be loyalty amongst us. But in 2 Kings chapter 1, I read this. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by the whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elijah said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. 
And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came uh, forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that thou, the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as, I, as, I, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they two went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood uh, to uh, view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither uh, and thither, so that the two went uh, over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, uh, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that he, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went on by a whirlwind into heaven. Of course, we know Elisha went on did many mighty works, even many, some of them greater than even Elisha had done, that God used him in a great and powerful way. But I want you to see this great loyalty that existed between these men, especially in the, in the case of Elisha towards Elijah. Uh, he, he was faithful and he was loyal to this man who was really a mentor to him. And, uh, and uh, his mantle, Elijah's mantle, was about to pass down to Elisha. It was a great relationship. Uh, we think of Jonathan and David and we think of others in the Word of God uh, and the relationship that existed between them. We saw, see Paul and Silas and Paul and Barnabas and we see others that had great relationships in the New Testament as well. Uh, and that really is the way it ought to be. We should have these kind of relationships. Our hearts ought to be knit together in love, one with the other, so that we stand together. And I'll tell you what, we need to stand together more so than ever before. We need to stand together and be faithful, uh, one with the other, and be a friend to each other. Father, we thank you, Lord, for thy precious word tonight. We pray, God, as we look now into the wonderful book of Ruth, would you speak our heart tonight with this great uh, book? Only the first chapter uh, tonight, we're going to look at this uh, precious account in the Word of God, and I pray that you'd bless our time together and use what we see here in the Scriptures for our blessing and our benefit, for our edification, O God, and for our spiritual growth. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name, and for His sake, and to this I do say, amen and amen. Turn to the book of Ruth. We're only going to look at one chapter. There are only four chapters in this precious book, 85 verses in total. Well, what, a, what a precious book this is. In fact, I consider it one of the most profoundly beautiful books in the Bible. Uh, and many beautiful, wonderful, profound passages of Scripture. But yeah, this one is so precious and, and uh, so um, uh, wonderful when you read through it. I sat outside in the sun this afternoon and just read through this entire book. I mean, as I read through it, I just rejoiced in what I was reading. Of course, we know there's a lot here more than what I'm going to cover tonight. I'm only going to look at the first chapter. And by the way, I want to make a practical application tonight out of this uh, and just, uh, just uh, talk a little bit about this rare study and loyalty amongst these two women that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, uh, Naomi and Ruth. And what, a, what a, a precious relationship these two women had. And it was a very special relationship. And out of that relationship, uh, some very precious things uh, took place. And of course, we know there's a, there's a lot of other things here that we could take a look at tonight. I'm going to read some things to you very quickly before I get into the book. Uh, so just uh, open your book, uh, your Bible tonight to Ruth chapter 1. We'll start there in a minute. But I wrote an article back in uh, 2016 entitled, Ruth, A Precious Example of True, Loyal, Faithful Friends. Uh, and uh, as, I, as I considered this and I wrote these words down, I predominantly wrote it down from my, my uh, study uh, of Ruth chapter 1. And I just want to read this to you, what I wrote, and I'm going to just go through the scriptures uh, over the next few minutes. But uh, there is one, two verses of scripture here, Ruth chapter 1, I want to focus on tonight. And I want to make a practical, practical application out of this. Uh, about friendship, about loyalty, and what that all means and how it's defined in these two verses. And I'm going to read to you a, 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 a modern account of something that took place back in 1941 uh, during the last century uh, that's maybe taken a little bit out of context, but yet it just demonstrates this thing of loyalty and how we need to be loyal in our relationships one with the other. But I'll read this to you very quickly. I've been studying the wonderful little book of Ruth in recent days and have been richly blessed as I have spent time 
uh, much time meditating my way through one of the most precious and profound books of the Bible. This moving little treatise is full of types and shadows that fascinate me. It strikes me odd that it's a rare thing indeed to hear an exposition of this book in our day, and yet there's so much contained within its four short chapters. And I, I might say this and stop here. Whatever happened to the book of Esther? I mean, I, I've only preached that I can remember in my entire ministry. I've only preached out of Esther once. And yet Esther is such a rich book. Uh, there's so much in Esther. Uh, I was mentioning this to someone recently. God's name is not mentioned once in that entire book, but God's all through it. Uh, you can't remove God from it. The practical, uh, the practical teaching of the book of Esther is very, very important. We ought to read through that and preach through it more often. I could write line after line of the things to be learned uh, through a thorough study of Ruth, but I want to share with you a practical lesson that I see in the first chapter of Ruth that has resonated with me over and over again, connected with Ruth's relationship with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Elimelech had made the unwise decision to lead his wife, Naomi, and sons, Malan and Chilean, to Moab when famine came to the land of Israel. They should have never left the land. They should have stayed put and trusted God. Even in a famine, and, and maybe even especially in a famine, God will trust our faith and put us through many trials. They should have stayed put. Uh, but of course, God used this thing, even though they went to Moab, this wicked place that they went to. They left, uh, they left God's appointed place for them and went to Moab. Now we know that the Moabites, they came, they were descendants from, from Lot's incestuous relationship with his youngest daughter. They were born of incest. And so out, out of that uh, relationship, Moab uh, was the father of the Moabites. And of course, we know uh, the Moabites were uh, wicked people. A lot of paganism there, a lot of sinful behavior there, a lot of idolatry there. Uh, the Moabites were a pagan bunch with all the practices that are attended to an idolatrous people. In Elimelech's going to uh, that heathen land, the doors were thrown wide open to the consequences that bad decisions often produce. By the way, I say this, out of that situation... Uh, God, uh, God uh, rescued the situation. Sometimes in spite of ourselves, God will bring out of those situations things that we might not ever expect. And he'll sometimes use them in spite of ourselves, uh, maybe even occasionally against ourselves when we do these kind of things, make wrong decisions. So Elimelech's going to that heathen land. The doors were thrown wide open to the consequences that bad decisions often produce. Both of Elimelech's, Elimelech's sons married pagan Moabitesses, Ruth and Oprah, or Orpah. Unions that were certainly contrary to the perfect will of God. By the way, against the word of God and the commandments of God. Neither marriage produced children. So God didn't bless those marriages. Eventually, Elimelech, Malan, and Chilion died, leaving Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah widows. In the wake of all this, uh, they were left uh, almost destitute. But we're going to see this, and this is the, this is the message in Ruth chapter 1, uh, at least in part, Ruth loved her mother-in-law and chose to go with her. She returned to her own land, a journey that took them to Bethlehem, the eventual place of her Lord's birth. It would be there that Ruth would meet Boaz, the near kinsman redeemer, who is, as a type of, who, as a type of Christ, who redeem and marry Ruth, who is a type of the church, the, the bride of Christ. He was the nearest kinsman redeemer. Uh, the nearest kinsman, kinsman redeemer of her husband. And so he married her because he was the, the, the next in line to marry her. We, we won't go through all that, how that marriage ended up taking place. But just suffice it to say that he was the near kinsman redeemer, a type of Christ who would redeem and marry Ruth, who was a type of the church, the bride of Christ. What a wonderful thing this is. But in addition to all of the types of the book of Ruth, one of the outstanding things regarding Ruth's character that intrigues and speaks volumes to me is Ruth's loyalty and the deep friendship that existed between these two women. Uh, and by the way, this friendship is a friendship that endured. So we're going to talk about this just a little bit tonight. I won't spend a lot of time going through this particular uh, chapter of uh, the book of Ruth, but I just want to, want to tie all this together very quickly. And by the way, let me say this. We need to realize that, uh, uh, that uh, Ruth uh, was David's great-grandmother. Did, did, you, did you realize that? I, it's amazing. If you look at Matthew chapter 1, you'll see that Ruth is in the lineage of Christ. Boaz and Ruth are in the lineage of Christ. So Ruth and Boaz, when they married, they had Obed, who had Jesse, who had David. So she's right in the Davidic line. Uh, and certainly we, we know that from that Davidic line, inevitably came the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh. We know that he was born, uh, born of a virgin uh, in, uh, in Bethlehem. And we're going to see something there to tie it together in Bethlehem. We know all the story, all the account of that. So Ruth ended up this, this Moabitess woman, this Gentile woman, uh, who was married by this Hebrew, this Jewish man, 
uh, who, by the way, Ruth was a was a convert to Judaism. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, we'll see that from this dear woman in her relationship, her marriage to Boaz was in the Davidic line. She was in the line to the Lord Jesus. I tell you, that just is exciting to me. Uh, God's so good. He just, if you, you read the word of God, how could you not get excited about this stuff? But look in, look in Ruth chapter one. I'll go through this very quickly. Now it came to pass on uh, in the days when, uh, when uh, judges ruled. And of course, uh, some say 16 judges, some say 18, some say 20. Uh, I think I've settled around 16 judges during that time. Uh, and that era of judges ran somewhere between 400, 420 years. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, Bethlehem, Judah is a, an interesting name, uh, an interesting uh, title, an interesting name of this, of this place. Bethlehem uh, means uh, a land of bread or house of bread. And Judah means uh, praise. So Bethlehem was, a, was the house of bread and a house of praise. Well, I'll tell you what, it'd be better for him to stay there in the, in the house of bread and the house of praise uh, than to go to Moab, uh, the house of idolatry, uh, the house of paganism. So a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, uh, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, which, by the way, in Hebrew means uh, my God is king. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, which in the Hebrew means delightful or pleasant. And uh, the name of the two sons, Malin and Chilean, Ephrathites. Okay, think about that now. We're talking about Bethlehem, Judah, and Ephrathah. Now, when we think about that, do we not tie the birth of Christ uh, to Bethlehem, Judah, and to Ephrathah? I guess we do, huh? So it says, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and his name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malin and Chilean. And by the way, Malin means sick, and Chilean means pining. So these boys were sickly boys. Maybe even from birth they were sickly. Uh, we don't know what their health condition was, so we, not, we don't want to engage in any supposition. But we know that uh, that were their name. And that's the names that they were given. That's what they mean in Hebrew. And it says, They came into the country of Moab, and they continued there. We'll see in a little while that they were there ten, 10 years. And they had to be miserable. I mean, if you're, if you're a, a, a Hebrew, a Jew that believes in God, and you've been raised in that in that uh, that Jewish environment, and you uh, you uh, have been uh, certainly under uh, under God's word and, and and God's influence all those years and the commands of God, it must have been egregious and grievous for them uh, to have to live in this place called Moab just in order to get bread, just in order to eat. Don't, didn't they think that God could take care of them, but they stayed put in Judah? Didn't they think that God would take care of them? They stayed put in the land that God promised them and gave to them. Uh, obviously and apparently not. And they're not the only ones that did this. There were others in the Word of God that did the same thing. At verse 3, in Elimelech, Naomi's husband died. Uh, and she was left and her two sons. So now she's a widow. Nobody to take care of her but, but her boys. But now it says, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. Now, they ought not to have done that. They disobeyed the Word of God when they did that. I read that in my little article here. Uh, the name of the one was, and by the way, let me tell you this, if you, you go to Moab uh, and you stay there long enough, you're going to, be to begin to adopt their behaviors. You, you, listen, friends, if you and I spend time in the culture and waiting in the culture and running around the culture, it won't be too long before the culture rubs off on us. I, I, I guarantee you that even as a believer, you, you, listen, you can be a born-again believer, a blood-washed believer, but you hang around in the wrong places, in the wrong environment, with the wrong people, Inevitably, it's going to rub off on you, and you're going to start disobeying God and doing the things the world does, unless you're, unless you're an awful strong person. And, and, and there's a good possibility that, uh, that there, there will be those even that are stronger Christians that could get influenced by this, and little by little, incrementally. So, and they took them, the wives of the women of Moab, and I'm sure they tried to make some kind of excuse to justify this. The name of the one was Orpah, and uh, the name Orpah is an interesting word. In the Hebrew, it means a gazelle. Uh, the name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And of course, we know Ruth means friendship or friend. Uh, and they dwelled there about 10 years. And Malan and Chilion died also both of them. And the women was left of their two sons and her husband. So now all three of these women are, are widows. Now there's no one to take care of them. And here they are in Moab with no one to take care of them. And in that day, in that culture and society, this is not a good thing. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in, in, uh, in giving them bread. Well, now we're going to go back, to, back home now because there's bread there. Well, they should have never left to start with. 
And once they got into Moab and saw what was going on there, they should turn right around going back. But they didn't do that. Now, that's a poor leadership on the part of a husband, that's for sure, because he's responsible ultimately. Verse 7, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. So they went with her, and uh, they went with her, and they uh, went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. So these two girls were very kind to their mother-in-law, and also to their husbands. So even though these girls came from a pagan culture, from a uh, ungodly culture, they were they were good girls, uh, at least in a relationship uh, with uh, Naomi and with uh, with uh, the two boys. May I say this: that both of these girls watched Naomi, uh, and they watched the way she lived her life, and she couldn't help but have taught these girls about the God of Israel. So there was a testimony there, even though she was where she should have been. Of course, that's up that's all on her husband because he should have never let led his family there to start with and really ended up in a very bad manner. But she was a testimony, even there in Moab, to these two girls, and they saw that testimony. Verse 9, The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. In other words, so you ought to get remarried. You, you, ought, to find, you ought to find a, a good man to marry. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Now, there was a tenderness with these two young women towards their mother-in-law. And when they thought, now we're going to have to depart one from the other, after all these years together, the two of them kissed their mother-in-law and they wept. Uh, uh, sometimes parting is just sweet sorrow. Verse 10, And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. So both of them said they go with her. They go with Naomi back, to, uh, back into the land, back to Judah. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Uh, why will you go with me? Are there, not, are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. Uh, if I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, uh, and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Uh, would you stay uh, for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So she's a very discouraged woman at this point right now. And you consider this, of all that she's lost while they're in Moab, sojourning there in Moab. She lost them a lot. These two girls, up to this point, boy, they're showing great love and concern for their mother-in-law, and they're willing to go with her. At least, at least uh, they'd state that. One goes with her, and the other one doesn't. We'll see that in a minute. But she said, listen, even if I had a husband and I had children, uh, if I had two boys for you girls to marry, you're going to wait around for those boys to grow up to adulthood, and by the way, uh, you're going to be old women by that time. Uh, you're not going to do that. Uh, you're going you're to end up finding some men your own age to marry is what you're going to do. And you're going to find them from your own culture is what she's basically saying. Verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth claimed unto her. Now, this is what I want you to see. I want you to see Orpah. Uh, she made the decision right there that I, I'm not going with you because she was given the option. Now, it doesn't mean that she was disloyal to her mother-in-law. We saw that she was up to this point. But obviously the pull of Moab was on this girl and not the, not the pull of Judah, not the pull of the God of Israel. And so she went back to her people, the Moabites, and went back to their pagan idolatry and back to their false gods is what she did. Now that's, a, that's horrible, but she made that decision because she was given that option and that was exercising her own free will. So it says in verse 14, he lifted up their voice and wept again and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth claimed to her, it's interesting to see that word clave. It means she stuck to her like glue. She adhered to her like adhesive. She made the decision, I'm not going to leave you. It's just like it was with Elijah and Elisha. Elisha said, no, listen, I'm not going to leave you. Three times said, I'm not going to leave you. Listen, you may go here and you may go there, but I'm going with you. And so obviously he did go with him until inevitably Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind in the chariot. And so in verse 15, it says, and she said, behold, thy sister-in-law uh, is going back unto her people. And Naomi said this, and under her gods, return now after thy sister-in-law. That was bad counsel. That was bad advice because it's obvious here that Ruth wasn't going to go back. That Ruth had made another decision here. Now, may I say this? Ruth, I believe at this point, had made a decision. She was going to be a convert uh, to the God of Israel. She was going to put her faith and trust in the God of Israel. So would you not say she was saved? At this point, she got saved in this, with, with, as a result of this? I believe so. So she was putting her faith in Naomi and the God of Naomi, the God of Israel. 
Now, verse 16. Now, here's the one I want. Here's what I want to show you. These next two verses. I can hardly get through these without weeping. This is probably the most precious poetic statement of Scripture right here. I think it is. There's many that are precious, but this is, this is extra precious. Listen to this. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people should be my people, and thy God my God. Wherefore thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. What a, what a precious demonstration of loyalty. Not, not just to Naomi, but loyalty to the, to her, to the God of Israel. Loyal, loyalty to, to, uh, uh, to this woman that she loves so much, this, this relationship, this friendship that developed between the two of them. What to God that we saw these kind of relationships amongst our people today. I, I don't know about you, but I, there have been many times when I felt like I didn't have a friend, even amongst the body of Christ. That's a sad thing to say. But it's true. And it's sad, but it's true. I remember Lolo Hardy said one time when he was at our church and stood in our pulpit, and I'll never forget it, he said, one time someone in his church there uh, in Tulsa asked him, Brother Hardy, if uh, if uh, you were going through a rough time and the circumstances were, were tough uh, and you had to depend on a church member or uh, one of the men that you served with on that submarine, which one of them would you put your trust in? Which one do you believe would be uh, the one that you could stand with and who would stand with you? He said, that, there's no, no question whatsoever that it would be those men on that submarine. And he said, many of those men were unsaved men, but they were faithful to one another and they were loyal to each other because there's a bond that exists amongst military people that many times doesn't even exist amongst Christian people. And yet we as God's people should be closer in our relationship and our bond with one another than any military member that ever existed on the face of the earth. I think of the Roman army. The Roman army, the, the develop, they developed a bond amongst themselves that was really, uh, it was really the, the key to their success on the battlefield. Uh, even the Greeks had that, but not like not as much as the Romans. The Romans had a bond. There was a there was a camaraderie amongst the Romans, the legions that uh, that was very unique in their time until inevitably Rome was destroyed from internal decay, rotten corruption, and civil war as well. And so I see this, read this two precious verses of Scripture, and I I just stop here and I just want to spend time thinking about this, and it makes me look at myself and I want to know in my own heart, am I the kind of friend of people that I ought to be? Many times I know that I fail in this area. I wanted to read this to you from modern history and every time I read it, it speaks afresh to me, but it's a, it's a historical account that's verified and it's, it's not just some made up statement. It actually happened. But this took place in 1941 during the very early days of the World War II. We know that Great Britain uh, declared war against Germany in 1939 when they attacked uh, Poland on the September the 1st of 1939. And then they had a year, they called it the, the silent war or the phony war before things really heated up. And the Hitler's uh, uh, troops began to uh, spread across Europe and started to occupying countries. And up until uh, December 7, 1941, when we were attacked by Pearl Harbor and several days later, Nazi Germany declared war against us under the Tripartite, Tripartite Act. Uh, we, we know that England stood alone. No one stood with him. And Churchill wanted to get America involved because he knew that if we didn't, he didn't have an ally fighting alongside of them as powerful as America, that they would probably lose the war and Germany would occupy Great Britain. And in their history, they would have been, been occupied by the Romans and by the Nordics and they, they, would have, they didn't want to be occupied by another foreign force ever again. So in 1941, Roosevelt sent one of his most trusted advisors to Europe uh, to get a sense of the situation on the ground. His name was Harry Hopkins. Roosevelt was under immense domestic pressure not to enter the war. But he knew that Britain and Russia, if Britain and Russia collapsed, the history of the world would forever be altered. First his envoy went to Russia, then to Britain. He met Churchill and he was given a tour of the armed capabilities of the British Army. 
His mission was to report on how badly American intervention was needed. We know the Lend-Lease program had already started. Uh, and uh, we were giving them old World War I destroyers, I think 100 of them initially, uh, and they were converted into uh, British destroyers. They were early, early used to build the backbone of the, of the British fleet. On the last night of his visit, historian the late Martin Gilbert tells us, Churchill and Hopkins were given a dinner in Glasgow, Scotland, by the regional commissioner for Scotland, Tom Johnston, uh, at the station hotel. After, after dinner, Hopkins leaned over to Prime Minister Churchill and replied, I suppose you wish to know what I'm going to say to President Roosevelt on my return. Well, I'm going to quote to you one verse from the Book of Books. And this is what he said, Whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Then he added very quietly, even to the end. Observers present saw the prime minister in tears. He knew what it meant. So even though Harry Hopkins, and I don't know if he was a saved man or not, he died uh, right towards the end of the war, I believe. He was a very sick man. Even, even though Harry Hopkins may not have been a saved man, he knew enough of Scripture where he took this passage of Scripture and he applied it in a practical manner which to me is very tender because it just demonstrated the, 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 the friendship between America and Great Britain. This, this nation that not too, many, uh, not too many years before, not too many decades before, we declared our independence from and fought a war against. And not only once, but twice. And yet still, that relationship that existed between uh, the Anglo-Americans the Anglo-American bond was so strong that Harry Hopkins made this statement from the book of Ruth to encourage Winston Churchill that uh, we're your friends and we'll stand with you. And we did. Inevitably, in the end, we did. And we know the result. And it began on the beaches of Normandy when we invaded Fortress Europa. And inevitably, we stood next to Great Britain and that war was won along with many other allies. So I read this and I think, wow, what a wonderful testimony to loyalty and faithfulness as a friend. Verse 18, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So the two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is, is this Naomi? And she said unto them, call me not Naomi, but call me Mara, which means bitter, chastised. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Well, that's not really true because she came back with Ruth. She, I guess she didn't realize at that point what, that, what was going to come out of that. Uh, saying, the seeing the Lord had testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. So Naomi returned to Ruth the, with Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which re returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Just imagine what was going to come out of Bethlehem uh, centuries later. I mean, just think about this. Think about the wonder of this. But I, I wanted to point out to you the loyalty that, that, that developed between these ladies, that, these women, uh, the loyalty that was there. Uh, what, a, what, a, uh, what a blessing this is. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's Jesus. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loveth at all times a brother's born for adversity. So when things get tough, we stick with each other. Proverbs 27, 9, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Proverbs 27, 9, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Proverbs 27, 6, faith for the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, backstabber. Amen, backstabber. Job 6.14, to him that is afflicted, uh, pity should be showed from his friend, but he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, two are better than one because they have a good reward for, the, for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Amen. I, I suspect and I know that Ruth would have laid her life down for Naomi. I really believe that. I want to give you, just as I close this message, uh, I want to give you just some of the attributes of a true friend. And I think that sometimes these attributes are missing. 
So but let me read a couple of these attributes of a true friend. When you stumble or fall, a true friend is there to help pick you up. A true friend does not impose upon your friendship for his own personal gain. A true friend does not withhold his friendship and fellowship as a means of punishment when you disagree with him or her. A true friend seeks to encourage you to do right, live for Christ, and do his will. That's a true friend. To live, a true friend will encourage you to live for Christ. A true friend is not a yes man, but is willing to exhort, admonish, and rebuke in love when necessary. A true friend develops a spiritual relationship, not merely one based upon mutual emotional or affectional attachment. A true friend does not make unreasonable demands in order to earn or merit their friendship or to maintain that friendship. A man or woman who is a friend will have friends. Friendship is a two-way mutual thing. A, a friendship that is fruitful will be centered around Christ, not just mutually shared interests and human likes and dislikes alone. Uh, a true friend is a giver, not a taker. He or she expects nothing of the relationship other than what he or she can bring into it. A true friend does not cover up your sinning and ignore it. Rather, he or she is willing to confront it and take the necessary biblical action needed to help you deal with it and get things right with God. A true friend makes no requirements or unrighteous demands of others in order to be a friend. Amen. A true friend never places a stumbling block of offense in a brother's or sister's path. A true friend does not tempt others to sin, but is an example of holiness and righteous separation from God unto God. A true friend never pulls a brother or sister of the Lord down, but lifts them up uh, by walking before them in righteousness. A true friend is transparent. When we have nothing to hide, we can be totally transparent. And I think that's important. Transparency is missing today. Everybody wants to be living a secret life. That's a problem. It's not that you have to share everything with everybody. There are some things that are private and personal. But I'm just saying transparency sometimes is not a wrong thing. Uh, and, and I'm careful with that. I don't want to be overly transparent. But I'm probably more transparent than most people. And I can even be transparent in the pulpit. And sometimes I'm willing to confess things in my life uh, that uh, have been uh, had, a, had a wrong effect upon me, things that I've learned that, that I shouldn't have done and corrected those things, and even sometimes things that I am doing that need to be corrected. Uh, I don't want to be a hypocrite or a phony, and you shouldn't want to be that way either. But it's not that we have to share everything. You understand what I'm saying. But transparency is sometimes an important thing. So all these things are very important if we're going to have faithful, loyal, genuine relationships. And oh, by the way, let me say this. True friends keep confidence. That's a big problem. A lot of people that you think are your friends may not be your friends because you may tell them something in confidence and it ends up being discussed by people it shouldn't be discussed with. If you take, if you hear something in confidence, unless it's a crime, <clears throat> unless it's a threat to the, to, the, to the church and the pastor needs to be aware of it, by the way, we shouldn't hide things the pastor thinks he needs to know. When I was pastoring, I couldn't stand it when people would cover things up and hide them from me and I'd many times be the last one to know about it. If I needed to hear about it, I want to hear about it. Otherwise, I wanted people to resolve the issues amongst themselves. But, trans, but listen, this thing of keeping confidence is important. If I tell somebody that I'm going to keep something in confidence, I better do it. Because if we don't do that, we're not a faithful, loyal friend. We're a backstabber. And there's too much gossip goes on today amongst God's people. And the bad thing about it is the way people handle many times, someone will tell you something and ask you to keep it in confidence. The next thing you know, that person that you ask to keep it in confidence is on the phone and they use the guise of prayer. Would you pray for sister so-and-so? Uh, just keep it between us. Uh, I, I, I have this in confidence, but just pray for this individual. What you're doing is you're beginning a chain of, co of gossip. You know that's what you're doing. You know you, you're doing that. And that, my friend, is evil. That's not demonstrating uh, holiness or godliness. You, if you say you're going to keep it in confidence, do it. I have very few men that I trust today that I can say, hey, Brother, listen, I need to share my heart with you. can keep this in confidence. Very few men that I can trust to do that. And they've proven themselves to be real, genuine friends by doing exactly that. It never comes back to me, and I never hear it from anybody else because I know they've kept it in confidence. And I guarantee you, if someone hasn't kept confidence and you shared something with them and they're not keeping confidence, it'll inevitably come back to you and you'll know what they did. And oh, woe is them when they do that. Amen? I trust this has been a blessing to you. Uh, I, I've tried to share my heart today with you in love. It's it, it just something that really has gripped my soul, not just today, but for a long period of time. I'm not always the best friend I ought to be. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a biblical friend. Um, I ought to be a friend to all of God's people. 
even when there's disagreement. I mean, I have men that I know that's not, they're not on the same frequency with me. They don't agree with me in some areas, neither I with them. But I can still sit down with them, and I can still have a cup of coffee with them, and I can still fellowship with them one-on-one. -on -one. may not be able to share the pulpit with them, might not be able to preach in their church, might not be able to engage in some activities with them, but at least I can, I can have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with them where I can try to be a help and encouragement to them, at least to be someone they can listen to. And that I can listen to. They can listen. I can listen to them. We need to listen to one another. So this thing's important to us. Amen. Well, I trust the message has been a blessing to you tonight. Uh, and I trust it's been a help to you. And I trust that it's uh, been a, a source of encouragement and education. Let's be friends to one another. And let's demonstrate the spirit of a Ruth. What a, what a joy this woman was. And a Naomi. She, she, these women loved each other. And she claved to her mother-in-law. We ought to cleave to one another, especially in these days. We need each other right now. We need each other all the time, but right now as we go through the present distress. Father, we thank you, God, tonight for the message you've given to us. Thank you, O oh God, for the example of Ruth, the Moabitess that became a convert uh, to, the, uh, to the biblical uh, truth of Scripture, to the God of Israel, that she put her faith and trust in you, O oh God, and she, uh, she was born again, Lord. She became a believer in, in the God of heaven, the God of the Bible. She put her faith and trust in you, O oh God. How we thank you for that tonight. Lord, might we be true friends. Might we be loyal and faithful friends. Might we stand together, uh, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. And might we, oh God, support one another as we should. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for being able to gather together in the house of God. We pray for Pastor tonight, Sister Amy. We pray for the other families in our church. Be with each one. Be with every household. Keep them safe and watch over them and keep them healthy. We'll thank you now for these things in Jesus' name. And to this I say, amen.